our tagline of FPG is human performance unleashed. So it's the leashes that hold people back from executing on that knowledge. So I developed a simple formula that's trademarked and it's in our, our book and it's the kind of the foundation of our program. It's performance equals knowledge minus leashes. The performance is what you do. Knowledge is what you've been taught to do, like those four steps of top grading the area that you suck at. The leash is what is holding you back from doing those things. And there's four types of leashes. Welcome. This is the host of the Onward podcast, Emily Harmon. Today, I'm speaking with Jason Forrest. Jason is a certified addiction prevention specialist, and he's also a certified master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming. This is a persuasive communication model engineered to help people overcome their obstacles. Jason is passionate about bringing a psychologically driven behavior change model to all parts of life. And in this episode, we talk about how every setback is a comeback in disguise. And when you can master your own mindset, you can master your current moment, no matter what is happening around you. Your ability to move forward to achieve your goals is dependent on your ability to remove the mental leashes holding you back. Your mental programming is your thickest piece of armor. You can master the stories in your own head. And then when you do that, you can stand strong when you face difficult situations. And that's what we talk about in this episode today. I hope you like it. Jason, welcome to the Onward Podcast. I'm glad to be here. I'm super excited to talk to you. Yeah, I'm excited too. This podcast is all about telling stories, teaching people how they how to overcome adversity. And I think that we learn from hearing other people's stories about the an adversity that they faced, how they overcame it, realize that we're not alone. We're not the only one in uh, our situation. And we too can apply some of these things. So whether somebody's adversity is what you what you faced, if it's not the same exact same adversity, it doesn't matter. A lot of the types of things that you know, skills or mindset that people use to come overcome adversity can apply no matter what the adversity is. One hundred percent agree with that. My, one of my philosophies is that I do this um, pretty often. I, I, I ask myself, in what area do I suck at the most? And I know that's a kind of a harsh question sometimes to ask. And Right now in our general population, the more acceptable answer is, is or question to ask is, um, what's my area of improvement or what opportunity should I focus on? I don't think people really will do anything about that if they look at what's an opportunity I should improve on. And so I'm very big about, okay, which area do I suck at the most? And is it my marriage, my relationship, my parenting? Is it my finance? Is it my business, my health? You know, and then what I do is I go and find a master, a mentor that has got that one dialed in, that area dialed in, and I basically surrender to them. I go to them and I say, I need to improve in this area. And I need to, and I I want to hire you to coach me. Or in some cases, it might just be a mentor that's free. It might just be someone like, for example, here's a cool story. When we were the first time many many years ago, five, five or six years ago, we had won Inc. Magazine's fastest growing sales training company in North America. So we had tremendous year over year growth and we're just totally crushing it. And my head of operations came to me and said, Jason, in about two weeks, we're going to go bankrupt because we, we don't have enough cash to pay everyone. Whoa. <laughs> and I was like, how is that possible? We're, we're, we're selling like crazy and we're doing well and everything is great. And what had happened is, is the area that I sucked at was, was cash flow. I was great at sales but our company was not good at watching our cash. And even though we were making more money than we were spending, we weren't collecting that money in time. We didn't have enough receivables, weren't getting in fast enough. And so we weren't turning our cash fast enough. Well, I didn't know that was a thing that I needed to watch until I needed, until it happened. Right. Until I kind of was, until I was hitting the iceberg. And so, so I immediately thought, okay, well, who's someone that I know that has their financial situation dialed in? And his name was Bob McCarthy. And so I called him up and said, Hey, here's the situation. I really need your mentorship. And, and he said, no problem. All I ask is that you take me out for a nice steak dinner. And I said, no problem. I can do that. And so after a couple hundred bucks and, and some glasses of wine, he, he taught me a lot of things. He taught me how to have a 13 week cash flow. He immediately called the bank and got, and, and was able to get me a line of credit taken care of to, to kind of, you know, smooth over the times and to get my situation back in check. But, but I think that's an important process that everyone needs to kind of do is they need to have enough objective reality to say, what is the area that I suck at the most? Not what's a growth opportunity. No one really does anything with growth opportunities, but if it's an area that's really causing you pain, 
and you look at, okay, if I could relieve this pain, how would it improve my life? What would it really do for my future? What new benefits would come from that? Well, then you have some kind of meaning behind it. You have a why behind it. And now you can take action. You know, and that, how, do you know, how do you know if it's best for you to get better at something or to hire somebody to help you with something? I think that's a great, that's a great question. I, mean, I, I think that as a company owner, I would say that you need to know enough about the different areas of your life, of your business, your business life. You need to know enough to make sure that you can hold other people accountable to doing it correctly. So right. I think that's important. So like in the case of my finances, I do think that was an, a, an area that I needed to know enough about. So I was able to get a crash course and kind of immerse myself in what I needed to know about. And then once I took it over and I was in control of it and I figured it out, well then yes, I brought in people to run that for me, but I at least know from an executive level what they're supposed to be looking at. And they of course give me reports. Now I'm now I know, now I have that certainty right. uh, to make it happen. So I would say, I would say that's number one. And then, but yes, as you're, as you're growing your organization, I mean, the big thing that I think is important is that, that as a company owner, there's only really a, a couple of things that you're supposed to be doing. And that's based on the things that no one else can do, but you, but most company owners, they take on way too much. So like in our organization, we run our organization by a primary question. And so each individual employee has a primary question. It's the, it's the one question that they need to focus on and answer and have dialed in every single day that guides their business. So guides everyone their, has a different question. Everyone has a different question. Based so on like, a company's overall mission. So start with the, the mission of your company. And then how do you figure out, how do you, do you let them pick what their overarching question is or... It's through a kind of a co-creation, I would say, uh-huh. effect. So some of them are kind of obvious, but like our, our vision of our organization is to convince everyone they're enough. We are a sales development company. We're a sales training company, but we believe that the reason why people don't perform is the root cause of it is they just don't believe they're enough. I mean, that's the real problem with it. And so where most training organizations fail is they just try to teach people the behaviors of how to be successful, but they don't get down deep to the root problems. And so, for example, one of our core concepts that I wrote about in my most recent book called The Mindset of a Self Warrior, it's called the results matrix. And so the results matrix is just a cause and effect. So first you have the behavior of what a person's supposed to do. That then comes from an underlying motivation. So do they want to do that or they have to do that? Then that comes from an emotion. Is it an emotion of certainty or emotion of fear? That comes from a belief of I am enough or I'm not enough. And that comes from programming that they had through their experiences or through their parents and their upbringing, past leaders, et cetera. So what we do is we don't just teach the behaviors of how to be successful, but we go all the way down deep into the belief systems and basically reprogram them to make sure it's all in alignment. So that's our vision. Our mission is to redefine training, change culture, transform lives. But then like my primary question is, how can I be leading edge today? How can I be leading edge today? That's to move the needle forward. Marketing wow. though would be, how can I bring in one more lead today? Sales is, how do I move a sale forward today? Uh, sales management is, how can I coach a sale forward today? My head of operations is, how can I increase uh, speed and profitability of FPG today? So these are all you know, human resources would be, how can I uh, create a best place to work culture today? That's the head of the human resource. So they all have a different one. And that's what they should be doing 80% of the time. And that's how they define success. And then we've got individual KPIs, performance indicators that are congruent. There's no more than five per person that are connected to their primary question. So that's, that's how they're measured. That's how they're operated. And it gives them clarity and certainty of how to, how to move forward. So how did you get into this? How did you start this company? So I think probably like most entrepreneurs, I did it out of being upset. There wasn't any other option out there. So I grew up in sales and then went into sales management. And and then I became the head of training for a Fortune 500 company. And I would, you know, I was tasked to to find outside training providers and be certified in them and then teach that concepts to our people and have internal trainers and so forth. And I, and I bounced around and did, went through several different sales training programs and sales management leadership programs. And I just didn't feel like any of them were relevant enough. And none of them really solved the problem of what's really holding people back from doing these things they're learning in these training seminars. So I just said, that's it. I've got to solve the problem. And, and you know, and it's hard to change things from the inside. Yeah. And so as a head of training, I kept getting resistance with my company. Well, just stay to the course, Jason. That's not your area and so forth. And, and so I just said, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm done. <laughs> And so I left, this is about 13 years ago or so, and partnered with someone else. We did that for a few years. And as I was becoming more passionate about training programs and mindset and just management co- development, coaching, 
different things. My partner wasn't as passionate about those things. And so nine, almost 10 years ago now, we, we split up and I've, I have my own company and just been focused on it ever since. So how important is mindset? Well, I mean, the, the cliche statement is that your success is about 85% your psychology and about 10% your behavior and about 5% luck. <laughs> so, but I mean, it's somewhere in that, right? So let's say it's 5% luck. You could say it's 15% your behaviors and strategy. And then you could say it's, you know, it's 80% mindset and beliefs. But I mean, the steps of how to be successful really aren't that hard. I mean, that's, for example, I am sure that that you know, you've had a lot of people on your show that have shared with people some strategies they do on how to be successful. I mean, I've just given you guys one right out of the gate here. I said, find the area that you suck at and then go find the person that you know that's the best at that. Ask them to mentor you and then do exactly what they tell you to do. That's, that's number four. Those four steps, those are very easy, but it's easy to not do it. No, oh, it is because it's easy to not want to take someone else's advice or to not be able to admit that you suck at something. That's right. To not want to take other people's advice or to figure out, feel like uh, you can learn something naturally or on your own. That's it. Yeah. And people just going through the journey of those four steps of, again, going from, well, what's an area that I should improve on to, no, where do I suck? Like that's a different belief system to, you know, number two is, okay, who am I going to go find out there that's the best at that? Number three, to ask them to be your mentor. And then number four is to 100, 100% fully surrender to everything they tell you to do. You know, I had another story about this. So, well, not to get that story, but that's an example of mindset. Those four steps are easy. That's right. not, that's not, you know, but it's the leashes. So our tagline of FPG is human performance unleashed. So it's the leashes that hold people back from executing on that knowledge. So I, I developed a simple formula that's trademarked and it's in our, our book and it's the kind of the foundation of our program. It's performance equals knowledge minus leashes. The performance is what you do. Knowledge is what you've been taught to do, like those four steps of top grading the area that you suck at. The leash is what is holding you back from doing those things. And there's four types of leashes. So if you were to write down right now, SSRR, so four types. First one, self-image. Self-image is I don't, my identity. I don't, I don't define myself as someone who can do that. It's not, I don't feel worthy of that, or I don't have the self-esteem or the confidence to pull that off. That's self -image. The next S is for a story. A story is anything external. Well, I just don't think it's the right time right now. I'm going to wait until next quarter or after the first of the year. I got to get through the holidays. That's a st an external story that, that there are people. A reluctance, that's the next R. Reluctance is a situational fear. You know, well, I'm afraid to do this because... You know, the person I want to ask is a friend of mine and I just don't want to kind of cross business and friendship and I don't want to be vulnerable in that area, right? Mm -hmm. And then last is a, a rule. And a rule is anything I need to see, feel, or hear to give myself permission to take action. So when I see this as a pattern, then I'll do it. But right now, I mean, yeah, I suck at blank, but it's not really causing me any kind of problem. Right. And so, you know, I mean, yeah, if I lose X, Y, Z business or such and such happens in my life. If I see the following things or I hear the following things or when the following conditions, yeah, then I'll take action. Well, I mean, so look, think, look, think of how many rules you have to get away through. <laughs> so so that, that's the leash. And so what, what yeah. we do and, and we focus on at FPG is, is teaching them the very simple step-by-step -step processes to get unstuck but then showing them and bringing awareness to what leash is holding them back from taking action and then showing them tools and practices on how to remove those leashes. So in the book I wrote, The Mindset of a Sales Warrior, there's 42 strategies on how to remove those, those leashes. Where do you give this training? Do you give it to the military? I don't remember getting that in, when I worked for the Navy, but... That's interesting. So uh, we don't give it to the military. However, a lot of our research people in the military do these things. Maybe not when, maybe not as of today. Like, so for example, we talk a lot about flow. We talk a lot about, you know, removing fear and we have references in there of practices like box breathing is something the Navy SEAL uses to um, control their emotional state. We talk about box breathing in there. So there's definitely strategies in there that we talk about that the, the military does use and mm -hmm. are embracing as well as uh, sports teams are very big into using these strategies to, re to remove resistance, as well as like Google and Apple and high-level executives and Elon Musk and Richard Branson. Those are all people that are, that are mindset junkies. Right, right, right. Definitely. But you think that if we focus more on mindset within the workforce, 
we would have much more productive, happier employees. I don't think we focus on mindset enough. We don't. We don't. And that's a new, that's a new thing. But let me, let me put some evidence behind this to make everyone feel like it's something they should do. So if you kind of break down the way your brain works, there's two parts of your brain, and that's your conscious mind and then your subconscious mind, right, from a mindset perspective. Well, the research says that 95% of our decisions we make on a daily basis come from our subconscious. 5% come from our conscious. Now, well, okay, well, why is that a problem? Well, it's not a problem when you're driving down the road and you're on right. autopilot and all of a sudden you're like, where? Why, how, I'm not even paying attention to what I'm driving. Well, you're not in a wreck because you've programmed your subconscious to be on autopilot that you are aware of what's going on, but you're not really aware. You're thinking about something else, but you're still driving safely. So it's helpful, but there's a lot of cases where it's not helpful. So for example, if you have certain desires and wishes and dreams that you're, you're wanting out of your conscious mind, I'm going to do blank, then you find yourself constantly talking yourself out of taking action, that self-talk, or you self-sabotage in some way, well, that's your subconscious hijacking you. And what's interesting is that the research says that by the age of seven, 70% of our subconscious has been programmed. So the Jesuits would say, give me, a, give me a child for the first seven years and they will never leave the church. So they knew that thousand years ago. That's what we believe. Well, modern day neuroscience has proven that 70% of your subconscious has been developed by the age of seven. And by the age of 13, it's, ni- it's about 95% of your subconscious. So, so that means we got to go into your subconscious and we have to rewire its hard drive. So think of like every human being needs to adopt the mindset that they are a hacker for their own mindset. A hacker goes into a computer system and rewires it to do what it wants it to do for the benefit of them. They need to do that for themselves and to rewire their hard drive. And there are some ways to do that. You can do, you can practice consciousness, mindfulness. Yeah. Uh, can really do that. You could also practice hypnosis. One of my certifications is in, is in hypnotherapy. So people can practice hypnosis. You can also practice habituation. So there's only three ways really to kind of change your subconscious. So one is being conscious, being mindful of what you're doing. Number two is through hypnosis to go inside that subconscious and reprogram it. And number three is the practice of habituation, doing something over and over and over again until you don't think about it ever again. And so, I mean, habituation technically, in my opinion, is probably the easiest thing to do. You can also do a practice that I like to do at night. And I talk about in the book where I put on headphones and I listen to something when I go to bed and that goes into my subconscious and that's reprogramming it because when you're going to bed, you're in a brain frequency of what's called theta. Well, theta is the same brain frequency you were in in the first seven years of your life. You didn't get into a higher consciousness brain frequency of of alpha, which is awake, but barely awake or beta which is I'm in baller beast mode like I'm in now. You're not into that until you're into the age of 13 or later. So your most transitioning state is in theta and that's in the first seven years or when you're waking up in the morning or you're going to bed. So putting those headphones on and listening to something is a really good way to reprogram your hard drive. What do you listen to? Like a positive mantra or something? Or Yeah, so I listen to anything that I'm just really trying to focus on. So for example, it might be like a Wayne Dyer or you know some sort of, or something that I'm learning. Just anything that I'm kind of learning specifically is what I'm listening to when I'm going to bed or when I'm waking up. Some sort of visualiz- visualization practice right. you know, is what I do. And so I, I do those type of things. But like if someone wanted to get my audio book, Mindset of Sales Warrior, that, they could listen to that. They could listen to that while they're waking up, while they're going to bed put their phone on a sleep timer and then it would just shut off, but it would be... So the way Theta works is that your your body is asleep, but your mind is awake. Now, the reason why that's important is your conscious mind is like the gatekeeper. Think of it like an executive assistant, a really good executive assistant. Well, you've got to put the executive assistant to sleep so you can get to the executive to influence the decision making. Right. That and that's what that theta does in that hypnosis process. Yeah. I think we're just learning so much more about the brain and the brain is tries to keep us safe. And so it says, well you've been acting this way your whole life and you've been safe and now you want to change the way that you're thinking or acting. Is that what happens? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean the, yeah, the, the, again, remember remember your brain, your subconscious mind is just autopilot. Yeah. Okay. But if, if your autopilot mechanism is not serving your intentions in life, then you must do something to change the autopilot settings. I mean, yeah. just think of it, you know, another metaphor would be think of it as like your, you know, your GPS system, you know, back in the, this is like a total old school thing. Remember back in the day, there was like MapQuest or something and yeah. where you had like in your, in your car, you know, you had like a GPS system and if you didn't go like 
get it updated every now and then, like the roads wouldn't be correct. Well, it's just why people don't usually use those. They use like their you know, user phone because it's constantly, the maps are constantly being updated on where you need to go. Well, that's to me a great metaphor for everyone to hear on why they need to do the practice of going to their subconscious and rechanging things or through habituation because you're, you just probably have an outdated map that needs to be updated. So it's not getting you to your destination that you desire, which is why most goal, goal setting fails I and mean, all that kind of stuff fails because the conscious mind is your goal setting. The subconscious mind is what allows you to get there. Look, that's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It's not because they don't have the same access to strategies. It's because their subconscious mind is only reinforcing what they already believe. Yeah. And that's what has to be changed. Yeah. So if we, you think, how will the world be different if we change that for more people? Oh, I mean, I think people can, people would accomplish whatever they, whatever they desire to, to want out of life. And because that, I mean, the reason why people are not, are not happy. I mean, just think about that. The reason why people are, are happy or not stre- or stressed out in life is because what they desire in their life or their expectations of what they think they, they're going to get out of their life or what they want out of life are not being met. So whenever anyone is super happy and super grateful, like think of you go on a vacation and like your kids and family or everyone is just super joyful and super happy. Well, that's because the experience of what's happening, the reality of what's happening is exceeding the expectations of what they thought was going to happen. But that's not, that's not the case for most people. Most human beings don't have a, a vacation or honeymoon life. So right. their, their life right. is, is, man, at the age of 41, I sure thought I'd be more successful than I am right now. Well, their expectations are higher than their reality. Well, in that case, in order to bring joy back in their life, they have to do the work of a mindfulness. So that's being conscious, present, or habituation, or hypnosis, or do all three, and they can get there even faster. I can't remember who uh, wrote the book. I don't have it with me right now, but I'm reading a book about mindset and just you know how it's so important to talk to your children about the effort that they put into something, not that they're just a natural artist or whatever, because I'm still in the beginning stages of that book, but you know, just that not everyone is a natural at every, at something, but if you work at it and what you're talking about is working at improving your subconscious. And some people might just think, well, it happens for him, but it's, it's not going to happen for me. Yeah. Well, and, and you're right. And so that book you're talking about is by Carol Dweck. She's a Stanford yes. psychologist Yes. and it's, you're right, it's just called mindset. And I do reference her book in my book on mindset because she's mm-hmm. the kind of the foremost expert on the idea of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Right. And you're correct. The reprogramming or the hacking or rehardwiring you got to do in your brain is in what she's referring to is that, that if we, we got to be careful how we're t- talking to our kids. So for example, if we go to our kids and say, Hey, congratulations on you know getting the A in the math on the math test. I can see that you are just so talented and gifted at that. So now we've created a black and white thinking that when they have a when they get a C in science or a C in reading, well then now that presupposes that they must not be talented at the other you know that whatever they got the C in right right. And so instead you would respond and say congratulations on getting the A. I am sure it's because of the following, the study that you did, the effort you put forth. I mean, I, I just saw you every single day at the coffee, t- you know, at the, coffee, at the, at the, the bar, you know, studying every single night, preparing right. for it. You deserved that because of your effort. You earned that because of your effort. Now, hey, let's talk about the C that you got in, you know, in reading. And so how did your effort compare to preparing for this reading test compared to this math test? Well, dad, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I just didn't put as much in. Why is that? What stopped you? Well, it's just not as fun. Well, is it fun because you're good at it or is it fun because what's, what makes it fun, you know, and it's helping the kid know that it's fun because it's, you're good at it and you're good at it because you practice. Right. That's what you got to figure out. That's the hard part, you know, and, and and you look, and I think kids get that. I mean, like, like a good thing to a metaphor I like to use with my kids is your life is a video game and because video games, you know, they, they get that. Right. And so, you know, if you're playing as a kid, you're playing a video game and you're on, kind of level one and you keep dying. And then in the video game role, they call it respawning. So they kind of come back to life. And so, and then you figure out, okay, well, why did I die? Let me learn how to get back on my feet. Let me figure out how to get past the bad guy. And then they get past the bad guy and they level up. Mm -hmm. And then they have a new challenge, a new demon, a new monster they have to go battle against. And then they die, they respawn, they figure out what worked, what didn't work. And they go a little further and they level up. And they just keep going through that process of leveling up, dying, respawning, learning, 
leveling up, dying, responding, learning. They just keep going, you know? That's how and life should be. That's just, and that's life. You know, that's yeah. So if you can help them see the connection between life is nothing more than a video game, and you just got to kind of see the connection of that, and you have to kind of play your life as you're playing this character in this video game, you can do that, then now, now a human being disassociates, and now they can become the, the puppeteer over their own life. And that's what we need to be, right? We need to be the, ma- the maestro over our own life, which I think so many people, they're too associated. They're too, they're too in their own body. Yeah. You know? and they, they say things like, well, that's just not me. I can't do that. That's never been possible for me. No, no, no. Now, disassociate, be the player of your video game. And how would you puppeteer this? How would you maestro this? How would you play? Well, I mean, I would just keep figuring it out until I figured it out. I would keep, I would level up and then I would die and I would respond and I would figure out what worked and what didn't work. Okay, well, that's the advice you got to give yourself right now. That's how life is. Just look at it as a video game. Do you think that, was there something that happened to you when you were growing up or whatever that you think led you into this uh, line of work? So I was very fortunate that my dad is, he's 80 years old and he is probably the most optimistic human being on the planet. Mm-hmm. So I think I was very fortunate in that case. I had good programming in that case. And I also grew up where he was very into self-help and mm-hmm. listening to audio cassette tapes, driving around in cars and stuff like that. So I was very programmed in an early age that that was something that was very important to me. And even when I became negative and, and dad, I just can't do this. And he would say, you know, you're not allowed to say, I can't do anything. You just currently don't know how to do it. And so we'll get you tutoring or we'll yeah. get you an extra coach. Or I mean, his solution was always, if I couldn't do something at school, I need a tutor. If I couldn't do something in sports, I needed a coach. Like it was, what, what do I need? What's the extra tool or resource that I need? Which is interesting because, I mean, he didn't know, you know, he doesn't know what we know now. He just kind of, it was just almost his kind of belief system. But, you know, now I'm one of 2,000 master practitioners in neuro-linguistic programming. And one of the belief systems of NLP is that we're all doing the best we can with the resources we have. And so if you want to do better, you just need more resources. Yeah. That's and that's what, I mean, what, that's what he was taught. saying. Yeah, that's what he was saying. And he wasn't saying you can't do it. He was just saying, go ask for help from somebody who can help you with learning how to do it. Yeah. And he was just saying, look, you're doing the best you can with the resources you have. And you're getting a C in math. That's because that's the resources you have. And if you want to get a B in math, then we got to get you more resources and then you'll get a B. And then you want to get an A. It's just, but it just, that's how life's life real simple. Now? And Is he he's, he's 80 years old. He's still alive. I just saw him, just saw him this past weekend. And so yeah. I bet she's pretty proud of what, what you're doing. Does he see the tie into how he raised you to what you're doing? I don't know. I hope, I hope so. I'm sure. I'm sure he probably does. Yeah. Sure he probably does. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. So, have you shared one um, setback that you faced where you applied this? You know, when you, you were learning about cash flow with your company. Any other stories about that that you want to share? Oh man, I just have so so many different stories. So when I first started my company. It was just me, and I was uh, successful in the sense that I was um, the youngest ever million dollar qualified speaker in the National Speakers Association. And so I was very successful, and I have a story that kind of got me into that, but we tell from another date. But I wanted to scale because I was doing about 90 seminars a year and about 800 hours of coaching calls and training calls, and it was just, I was maxed out. Right. And so, in order to do more, I had to make a decision, and that was, you know, what am I going to, how am I going to let this stuff go? I'm going to, how am I going to transition and get stuff off my plate and kind of multiply myself? And I, I kind of did it the slow way, which is, I'm not saying necessarily what I said it was the right way, but it was the way that I knew. And that was, I was fearful of letting go of my clients. Mm-hmm. And so, I didn't train people properly. And so, because of that, we had some client damage along the way. Because they, you know, I wasn't really working with my trainers to replicate me and therefore they weren't getting the service that they desire. So it kind of started maybe tarnishing my brand a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just, I finally had to make a decision and that is, look, I got to pull the bandaid off because this kind of slow, the slow drip process is just not working. And so I just made a decision one day and that says, that's it. I'm going to be the CEO and I'm going to create content for people and I'm going to be the, you know, my, my company is going to be my client. So I don't even have clients anymore. My company is my client. And I'm going to, to train my company as if I was training a client. And then ever since then, that, that, you know, that's what really scaled the whole thing. But Was that hard to do? Oh, I mean, it's almost impossible to do. Right? It's, I mean, it's like giving up your baby. Well, there's a lot of fear because you, you, know, you don't want to lose clients. You don't want to lose revenue. And so again, I, just, so I kind of did the slow, the slow way. But I think if I was to go back to my version of myself there, I would say, look, that slow way is the hard way. And you really need to kind of burn the boats. Right. Know? Like here's a good, here's a good metaphor. The, 
uh, when Cortez was invading Mexico, there was no other conquistador who had ever kind of conquered Mexico. And so he, he went to the, the commanders and said, we got to burn the boats. So when we invade Mexico, we're not going back to Spain. We're either going to die trying or we're going to win. And I love that metaphor. I think it's a yeah, great metaphor. A that I think in life, people just don't burn the boats enough. They always have a, an escape. Well, I'm going to kind of dabble in this. And if it doesn't work, I've got to fail safe. Right. Well, you're, just, you're not going to ever do it. You know, you're not going to do it. You got to be all in. You got to burn the boats. That's really hard. That's really, really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Wow. So who do you go and speak to? What organizations? And where do you do this training? Like how would sure. someone find you? Yeah, yeah. So we have over 30 employees right now. And, and so we, we train all over the world, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Our programs, they go from huge enterprise companies that are $40 billion in size to just mom and pop organizations. Mm-hmm. And we've got programs for all levels. We've got an enterprise okay. program where it's private. We go to them. And then we've got public programs where an individual salesperson can go to our public program, our public follow-up, our public coaching program. We have a leadership program that's public as well that has public follow-up. So, so we, have, we have a price point for everyone that, that you know, people can be a part of. We used to not. We used to just have a, a private enterprise program, but we found that there was just there was too many people out there that the company wasn't big enough to afford us yet. And so we wanted to offer a solution for them. But people just need to go to fpg.com, which is our website, or I have an offer right now. So our book just came out. It's called The Mindset of a Sales Warrior. It's doing very, very well on Amazon and Audible. So people can buy it on Audible. They can listen to it where myself and my wife, Mary Marshall Forrest, all the president of the company, she and I discuss every strategy in the book on the Audible side. Or okay. they go to Amazon and they can get it. Or if they go to warriormindsetbook.com, so warriormindsetbook.com, the listeners of this podcast can go there. They can get the book for free. They just have to pay shipping and handling. And then there's some additional offers on there they can get. So they can upgrade to the audio version. They can get a goal setting guide. I've got some coaching. I've got some recorded coaching sessions in there. I've got some meditations. I have some sleep meditation. I have some workout tracks. I have a lot of extra things that people can go to and experience. They go to warriormindsetbook.com. If they don't do that, they can, of course, go to Audible or Amazon, but this gives them some extra things they can look at. All right. And then, you know, your book is The Mindset of a Sales Warrior. I went and heard Daniel, I read his book about how everyone's in sales. Mm-hmm. And I went and heard him speak about everyone's in sales. So, we are all selling every day. Yeah, well, and that's a leash, by the way. So that's one of the leashes uh-huh. that I address in the book is that people don't mm-hmm. identify themselves as salespeople. But, uh-huh. but yes, I do agree with what Daniel Pink says. And you know, especially if you're a company, I mean, one, if you're a company owner, you 100% are in sales because that's there's two problems in any business and that's sales problems and then all the other problems. And so you are in sales if you're a company owner. Uh, but then the second thing is that if you run a team, the mindset book will help you know what, their mindset's supposed to be and how to coach them to have that mindset. But then, you know, I I mean, I've had people that are, you know, stay at home moms and they've got a side business selling oils or as a realtor or something, and they're benefiting from this book. Or if you're a leader and you just, you know, you want to know how to lead people and influence people to see things differently. And you've got some leashes that hold you back from embracing conflict or then this book would help you as well. So this book really is about removing any resistance you have from getting your ideas across that will help someone else. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Any last minute tips for our listeners? Covered a lot of good stuff. Yeah, well, I just think, I think it sounds like we know the theme here. The theme is find the area that you suck at. Yep. Then go find someone that's better at you in that area and then ask them to mentor you or coach you. Most of them will do it for free. If you don't have resources to pay for a coach, just get, get someone for free. And then you need to just do exactly what they tell you to do. And then if you have resistance, you say, well, here's some alibis I have or things are holding me back, then you definitely got to pick up the book and the book will address what are the leashes that are holding you back. And then you got to do that self work. Because again, if your wishes and desires and dreams and aspirations are not being achieved after all the hard work you're putting forth, then it's, it's not a how problem. It's a, it's a mindset problem. It's a mindset problem. It's a mindset. You gotta get, uh, we got to get that stuff out of the way. Yeah, yeah. It's really easy to say, well, you know, that would work for you, but not for me. But we, and you're talking about, it can't That's a story. Can't work a story. For you. That's a story. And That's what right. are your leashes? And it just takes some putting the phone down, putting the, you know, stop watching TV, just really focus on yourself and really do some self-introspection and admit things to ourselves, which sometimes is hard to do. That's it. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been awesome. Being on this and, and please have me back. And also, 
Uh, again, Mary Marshall Forrest is an amazing, amazing speaker. We do all kinds of different speaking together and people can book us as a speaker together on fpg.com or I believe the website is called Mary and Mary and Jason Forrest.com as well as our speaker site. So, okay. Awesome. Uh, so have her, have her on the, on the podcast too. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you for listening today. I put a link to Jason's book, The Mindset of a Sales Warrior in the show notes. How's your summer going? As I record this, it's the 18th of August. Kids are going back to school and I'm hearing some stories that are pretty challenging. It's going to be a tough year, but we can get through it. One of the things I believe that helps us get through hard times is community. And that's why I started the Onward Movement. The Onward Movement is a Facebook group, but it's more than a Facebook group. It's an engaged community. We're all there supporting each other, helping one another. An example, tonight we have a Zoom call where you know people that are in the Onward Movement that don't know one another are going to come on and we're going to meet each other. People are making new friends, making new contacts, finding new job opportunities through the Onward Movement. Check it out. Just go to Facebook groups and search on Onward Movement. I also put a link in the show notes. Another exciting thing is I've um, worked with the daughter of a friend of mine to create some videos highlighting the some Onward Podcast episodes. And I've posted those videos on the Onward Podcast YouTube channel. So that's another way of listening to the Onward Podcast. Some are highlights and some are entire episodes. Not all of my episodes are up there yet, but one day at a time. There's uh, never enough time in the day to get done what you want to do. So you got to prioritize. And that's what I do. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for listening.